remember I was in and out of going into sleep, but I, then I had this really loud commotion. The only thing we never got to figure out, even up to today, is the motive for the killing of Mbai. So they said, they do not see him surviving, but even if he survives, then he's going to be completely retarded. The door was wide open, and I'm thinking, where's my dad? And All the suspects, all the three suspects, what they say is the same. The cassette talks about a murder case that was planned and that Norman Yaga gave a gun and 50,000 shillings to somebody, three people who sat in a car that I was in. Classified information and material in the hands of the police was stolen because that is what they are most. I miss that he hasn't seen me, you know, graduate and do my master's and actually be able to um, see me actually go for a PhD because his death impacted me. Tonight on Case Files, the professor's assassin. In 2002, Kenyan sent more than 600 delegates to the bombers of Kenya for a national conference as the country's long quest for a new constitution entered a crucial stage. Among the delegates was this man, at the time, a University of Nairobi lecturer and a father of four, Dr. Crispin Odiambombai. The man who will later be appointed the chairman of the devolution committee that was to propose ways of dispersing power from the then powerful central government. So when I came back to the house, my daughter told me he had actually left. You know, he had left. Now later, I don't know anyone. He told me that my husband had left to go to the university and came back. So I came back, I was joking. But I thought you told me you were not feeling well. How come again you left to go to the university instead of going to church? Margaret Owino, the wife to Dr. Mbai, says the husband used to arrive home early and rarely worked over the weekends. On the second week of September 2003, the lecturer opted to stay at home as the rest of the family members left for charge. I left. I ate lunch very quickly, then I left. I left around, around, around 2, around 2 to 15 for Kayole. But when I left for Kayole, because of the way Kayole is, I never carried my phone. Bai will later drive to the University of Nairobi, but was back home in time for lunch with his wife and daughter. And, and we just had a really amazing conversation and then I had to make lunch for him because my mom had to leave. So I made lunch, um, fed him, and then I went upstairs to sleep. At the time, the Mbais resided at the Adams Arcade estate and occupied house number six. Their neighbor was a then member of parliament for Kamkunji, Norman Nyaga, living in house number five. Funniest thing about that Sunday is that I was actually home because I never used to stay home on a Sunday afternoon. I would always find something to do. But that day, for whatever reason, I decided to stay. And um, yeah, then I left him asleep at the couch. In the evening of that day, three men casually walked into the house of the lecturer, fired several gunshots and simply walked away. The daughter says she did not see the people who shot the professor but heard the gunshots that claimed the life of a man she knew as a father and a mentor. I remember coming down the stairs and I could smell smoke, like I could smell just that. It was just a really pungent smell. And I remember being fearful and then I walked down and our house was made in such a way that this, when you came to the stairs, the corridor, there was a corridor 
right next to it and I and I was looking and the door was wide open and I'm thinking where's my dad and I looked and my dad was leaning against the wall and he was bleeding and uh, I was in complete shock for about two minutes and then he started wailing I think it's the saddest thing when you hear your parent crying like you know and you and he was saying why have they killed the son of Mbai you know why have they killed the son of Mbai and and then I just started screaming I, I, I didn't know what to do so I was screaming and I went outside of the house to the neighborhood and I started screaming and I was just saying my dad has been shot my dad has been shot help my dad has been shot Saving Bai's life was the first priority for the family members and neighbors, but the daughter told Case Files that things unfolded too fast. So at Nairobi Hospital, we, you know, um, they brought out a gunny and I saw him standing. You know, my dad literally stood. I didn't even actually know the impact of how much he had been shot. I just know there was so much blood. And I just know he was crying. I mean, I have never, I mean, I think that for me will forever stay with me, you know? And he stood up, I, he actually literally stood up and went onto the gunny and then he was taken in. Um, what was he saying as you were driving down my country? What was he saying as you were driving from? He just kept saying, why have they killed the son of mine? One of the doctors came and said things were not very well, that he had a lot of, you know, it was a lot of gunshots, even through the spinal cord, everywhere. There were almost over 10 bullets, so they said. They do not see him surviving, or even if he survives, then he's going to be completely retarded. So I know at that point, okay, when I was there, and I started, you know, I felt, I started crying, you know, because I thought now perhaps they were not telling me the truth, maybe I'd already died. Next thing I knew was when they came to tell us, he's dead. Yes, people tell me I was on the floor. That's all I remember about that day. The news of the killing of the university lecturers sparked all violent protests with university students staging demonstrations in major campuses. A section of the political class termed this killing a political assassination. The police treated the killing as homicide. Fighting mounting pressure to bring to book those behind the killing, a hard-pressed police department quickly set up a team and one personally coordinated by the then commissioner of police, Edwin Yaseda. Police investigators treated the killing as a normal robbery, but the fact that the killers just pulled the trigger and never stole a thing raised eyebrows. The story came um, smack in the afternoon, uh, in the middle of this bombers conference, and everyone was shocked because of the significant position that uh, Mbai was holding at the bombers, because he was in, char in charge of the devolution committee, which was the all-important committee at. Um, at Bomas. Uh, so for two days, the police say they were on track, I mean, on the trail of the uh, suspects, uh, they, were, they had leads. And then one day, information came through that they had arrested a couple of suspects. And they were interrogating them. And in fact, the police said they were on the trail of the killers. So for me, it looked like there was a breakthrough. After two weeks, police announced they had arrested a preacher and three other people in connection with the killing of the devolution chairman. The media was not told who these people were until a few days later. By his killing and subsequent trial became one of the most sensational trials in the country. Before the three were arraigned in court, the media broke a story that captured the attention of the government and the world. Told that in fact there was a recording of the invest interrogation of the suspects, which had happened at the flying squad in Parklands. So just to get to the bottom of it, we decided we we're going to lay hands on the actual recording of those interrogations, which we did uh, from the same police force. We organized with um, our sources to make a copy of the interrogations late into the night, stuck up late up to 1 a.m. And because this story was so significant, I did not want to leave it to any reporter or somebody who could be compromised or anything could happen to the trail of the 
of the track of the story. So I and my uh, deputy, Pomchetsi Makoha, sat up to actually get this information firsthand. And we drove to a particular location, got the tape, went back to office, previewed it a bit, and saw really graphic evidence of what was going on within the investigations. Um, and we determined that we will do the story. In the exclusive expose, the Standard newspapers published details of a confession of three suspects arrested on suspicion that they took part in the murder of the lecturer. There was a new twist that there was a split within the team which had been charged with investigating that murder, which sort of raised my curiosity. Uh, there was information filtering through that there was a cover-up, that some people wanted a certain line pursued as opposed to what had come through the investigations from the suspects they had interrogated. The breaking of the story in the media was followed by sensational claims on the floor of parliament that a member of parliament was linked to the murder. <laughs> The cassette talks about a murder case that was planned and that Norman Yaga gave a gun and 50,000 shillings to somebody, three people, who sat in a car that I was in, in Kawangware, on Saturday the 13th at 10 o'clock at night. That is what the cassette says. Senior editors of the Standard newspapers were arrested. The moment the story made headlines and the heated exchange in Parliament, by his killing had taken another twist. The only thing we never got to figure out, even up to today, is the motive for the killing of Mbai. That has escaped everybody. All the police officers involved in the investigations were suspended. A scenes of crime investigator, Thomas Chemueno, was later charged in court alongside a standard newspaper editor. Firstly, they charged me that I stole the tape. Secondly, they charged me again that I was the one who was uh, putting these suspects to confess. That uh, this suspect to confess for the person who killed this person. So, of which I, I, I was not. I was just a video grabber. I was recording the confessions and they were, in, they was, uh, in charge of the investigations. They were those people who were having the interviews from these people. So my duty was only to roll the camera, and that was all. The confession obtained on a tape recorded by a government security agent sparked an angry reaction from the internal security ministry. Information and material in the hands of the police was stolen because that is what it amounts to. It was stolen by, in, by connivance between persons in the media and the persons in the police force. Crime was committed. The question of the veracity of the information is neither here nor there. What is the fact is that crime was committed. In the committal bundles, the tape and its contents were not part of the evidence that the state had advanced against the accused suspects. In fact, the government deliberately supplied the courts with several statements, at times from one witness, the same statements the judge will later use to conclude the trial.